Welcome to the Downtown East Side Heart of the City Festival. Welcome to the Downtown East Side. Welcome to the unceded homeland of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slatletooth peoples on whose traditional territory and homeland we have the honor and the privilege to be able to work. Um, these people have been here on this land since time immemorial, practicing their culture, um, doing their songs, their dances, their traditional ceremonies, communicating their protocols. And um, we at the festival are honored to be able to add our small stream to this very large stream that's been here since time immemorial. Um, my name is Terry Hunter and I'm the executive director of Vancouver Moving Theatre, which I founded along with Savannah Walling um, in 1983 um, in Chinatown. Uh, we moved into Chinatown in 1975, and we established a studio along with Karen Jamison and a company that we had called Terminal City Dance. It was in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mock building at uh, Carroll and Pender Street. We watched the Chinese Culture Center being built, and um, we've been in this neighborhood a long time. Chinatown has been our home um, for over 40 years now, and uh, it's a place that's very dear to us. And um, it's the place that's given us a home and also a place to raise our family and a place to work. And uh, we're very grateful to Chinatown as we are to the larger downtown east side. And um, this is really a special occasion for me to be with the, the wonderful um, Mr. S Sid Chow Tan, um, who was such an important and continues to be such an important figure in the life of Chinatown and promoting the culture and the heritage and um, also very importantly the the social activism and the fight for justice around the head tax and um, Sid had such a huge role in bringing broadcasting to the community and being able to tell the stories of the community and um, I had the honor of meeting Sid probably what back in 2003 something like that and we've, I've become, he's become a very dear friend of me, of mine, and um, a dear colleague that we've done a lot of things over the years with. So um, it's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage, so to speak, Mr. Sid Chow Tan. Welcome, Sid. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, thank you for the intro. And uh, it's so glad to be part of the Heart of the City Festival and want to thank the uh, Downtown Eastside Small Arts Grant and the Heart of the City Festival for the support they've given me uh, to make this uh, presentation possible. And I'd like to express my thanks to the hundreds of volunteers, community television volunteers, festival volunteers, and volunteers that have helped in not-for-profit groups that made possible the showing of what we're going to do today. I think it's very important. Very few of them are named on the credits and all that, mainly because uh, some of them are forgotten to time and it would have been too long a list. Mm. So we had to cut it down a bit. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I have nothing more to say until uh, <laughs> the end, except acknowledge this traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Thank you, Sid. Welcome, welcome to Chinatown. Ham sui fao. Hmm. So, uh, um, audience, um, this is going to be a really special treat. I had an opportunity to look at um, a bit of the footage, just a couple of seconds, and right away I was just struck by. Oh my gosh, look at the young Sid Chow Tan. Oh my gosh, look at the young Jim Wong Chu. Um, this is really going back an incredible archival material that Chris that, that Sid has here. Um, the the show runs, the content that we're showing is uh, about one hour in length. I think I was told exactly one hour and two minutes, if my memory serves me right. And um, if you're on uh, Vimeo, um, do look in the chat function. Uh, or find the chat function, I should say, and um, put your questions into the chat function and they will be relayed to me and then I can ask Sid the questions um, after the video is over, which is, as I said, just in a little over an hour, 
um, I'll do an interview with Sid and um, we really enjoy um, getting the questions from you, the audience, because you have really insightful um, questions and, and you come at things in ways that I don't think of. So without further ado, here is archival footage from Sid Chow Tan and uh, we'll see you on the other side in one hour. Thank you very much, enjoy. this Guan Gong stuff. Is it true? Sure. I'm not surprised that Guan Gong is the guy that's really behind the uh, all the wealth and all the all the uh, experience and all the power and all the all the goodness that's uh, in Chinatown. I mean Guan Gong probably is is the you know is who knows he may be the head right now of, uh, of corporate Chinese North America. Find that the spirit of Guan Gong is all around us. Well, Guan Gong is looked on more than anything else as an ancestral god. But I think Guan Gong is a spirit. He's a spirit that's that's alive. It's much more than um, than simply an effigy or something of the past that you can talk you can tell little kids and there's a good story behind it. More than anything else, I think he has emphasized the spirit and the spirit is is what lives. And sometimes you see that spirit, a certain amount of pride, a certain amount of of coming out and doing something that's beyond the call of your own duty or your confines, your own station in life, or even your own courage. I mean in some way, we can look at it as saying, like, um, we can actually see this of Guan Gong uh, in our fellow, you know, our fellow Chinese Canadians. Also, one of Sid's re requests, this one's called Jimmy the Waiter. I think it's self-explanatory. I caught him picking his nose and flicking the snot into the cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> now that's for calling me a chink. I know he wouldn't hurt a fly, but would think nothing of serving it up with crackers. <laughs> The next part in the writing of the wrong in Canadian history is this, the Chinese head tax redress issue. The $23 million collected up to 1923 in head tax viewed in today's terms would equal $178 million in purchasing power, or if invested at 6%, would yield $896 million. It took two years for the average Chinese worker in 1923 to earn $500. Our society is committed to work with the National Council and other chapters of the National Council in seeking redress from the government because our calculation shows that at least half of the registrants for the head tax comes from the province of British Columbia. Now I'd like to uh, introduce to you our national chairman, Mr. Gary Yi, to speak to you. Thank you. Chinese immigrants first came to Canada 130 years ago, and thousands of Chinese workers labored very hard to build Canada's national railway. However, right after the last spike was driven in 1885, Canada thanked the Chinese workers by imposing a head tax of $50, and this later rose to $500 by 1903. 
And at that time, $500 represented about two years' wages for a Chinese Canadian. The aim of the head tax was to both discourage Chinese immigration and yet to make money from it at the same time. And the motivation was clearly racism. By 1923, Canada had collected $23 million in those days dollars in head taxes. And this amount today would be worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So Canada collected this from over 81,000 Chinese immigrants. And at the same time, Canada was paying European settlers to settle our West. In 1923, Canada passed a law which stopped Chinese immigration altogether. And this exclusion lasted until 1947, and really that's not that long ago. The impact of these 38 years of head taxes, and then 24 years of exclusion, cannot be underestimated. The Chinese Canadian community had its development severely hindered, and individual head tax payers also spent years paying off the crushing debt incurred by the head tax, either for themselves or for family members who they saved money to bring over. Also, in addition to the head tax, with the exclusion, most Chinese Canadians lived here for decades with little hope of bringing over their wives or their children. And our community became a bachelor society for many years. My grandfather was a part of that society. He came in 1917 and he paid $500 in head tax. He returned to China twice to see his wife, my grandmother, but he could not bring her over until 1952. And my grandfather is now over 90 years old. He's in a nursing home in Toronto. And I sometimes wonder if the government will respond to us in time for him to see that justice has been done. It has been over four years since the Chinese Canadian National Council received 2,600 head tax certificates from head tax payers or their families. It has been over four years since we formally requested the Government of Canada for action in this matter. It has been over four years since the Progressive Conservative Party promised to support an all-party parliamentary resolution to recognize the injustice, the discrimination, and the suffering. This is an issue of justice, not just for head taxpayers or their families, not just for the Chinese Canadian community, but for all Canadians. And I call upon your active support to achieve a fair and meaningful resolution to this urgent matter. Although our head taxpayers are very elderly, and some have passed away, the issue will not die. When we met the Minister of State for Multiculturalism and Citizenship, the Honorable Jerry Wiener, on, on October 28th, he said he was sympathetic to our cause. He said he would bring the matter to the attention of the Prime Minister right away. And he said he would bring the matter to Cabinet after the federal election. We both agreed to leave the meeting with cautious optimism. But I want the Prime Minister to know, we will not wait much longer. It has been over four years with a different multiculturalism minister every year. We cannot much longer. We cannot allow our elderly head taxpayers to just pass away one by one after having lived in Canada through decades of exclusion and separation and then not see justice done. We want action. It is only fair. The Head Tax Redress Committee in Vancouver has been very active, as Tommy Tao explains. One of the things that we have done is to go out and do a personal interview with those head taxpayers who are still alive that we could find, so that we can have a better understanding ourselves about what life was like when they came how they felt about having to pay the head tax, how they feel now about the issue. Because of the lack of resources, we weren't able to interview everyone on our list, but we did try some. But the sad fact is, 
all of our head taxpayers are very elderly now. They're all, if not already in the 80s, very close to the 80s. We started the issue four years ago, and we cannot wait much longer. Even if the government should decide to redress the issue, to offer personal compensation, the time is so short that if we don't take action now, redress will lose a lot of its meaning. Because redress, in large part, is indeed for those who have been discriminated against. As the forum progressed, the floor was open to the public, and we took the opportunity to ask this question. I'm just wondering what kind of redress can be made to an individual that has probably already died, been forgotten, and nobody even knows who he is. What about the people that have no living relatives to take up their cause? For those who have passed away, uh, also we would be seeking commemoration, such as uh, a plaque uh, where the last bike was driven, or a plaque in the House of Commons is a railway committee room in there. We will also be seeking those aspects. As you know, the head tax issue, I'm glad that the CCNC has brought it forward and the agenda after several years of discussing the issue. It's very important, I believe, as the Chinese, in the Chinese community, that the diversity of the Chinese community unify around this issue. But I think it's going to be very important that every segment of the Chinese community, particularly in Vancouver and nationally, be educated on the issue and support the issue. Um, because it is part, this will be the fine, one of the final chapters of, the, of our history. Therefore, I hope, and I see here, we've got one segment of the Chinese community, but the other areas of the Chinese community will come out and support this issue. We're here at the David Lamb Auditorium at the Chinese Cultural Center this November 6th day of 1988, where we were just treated to a very enlightening and informative forum on the Chinese head tax redress issue. There are many speakers here, and we were particularly proud that Gary Yi from the Chinese Canadian National Council was able to appear. Along with him were many speakers from political parties, as well as speakers from local Vancouver organizations. For more information on the head tax or to support head tax redress, contact the Chinese Benevolent Association. Alternative Community Open House here at 105 Kiefer. <laughs> My name is Yuli Chan and I'm here on behalf of the Chinatown uh, Action Group. Uh, we are here today uh, with a group of uh, youth organizations um, who are very concerned about the developments here in Chinatown. So we're here to take some action and we're going to let you know what this is all about. So right now I'm going to hand the mic over to Tracy Morrison. Um, she's going to do a territorial acknowledgement of the land that we're on. Tracy Morrison is uh, with the Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction Society. I'd like to say that I am not from this territory, but thankful that we can um, acknowledge that we are on Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And actually live, work, play, to be able to have these meetings and um, gatherings on their unceded territory. And to also thank the Creator for each and every one of you, and also the people who are out there who need homes. And let's have a great um, open house and all my relations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tracy. Um, I also just want to um, add to the acknowledgement that we know that our struggle here today is ultimately for social justice, which is tied to the struggle for land liberation and self-determination of Indigenous peoples. Um, we understand that Indigenous people and people of color here in Canada have always been displaced, um, and it's been, we've been displaced under capitalism as part of the long history of systemic racism, and it's continuing today through the gentrification of our neighborhood. So we strive to unite our struggles um, to belong to a place, to a sense of community, and to not be displaced any longer for profit and commercial development. So we are holding an alternative open house here today in response to the City of Vancouver's and the developers open house which is happening later on today from 5 to 8 at the Chinese Cultural Center. Um, the developers are BD Living and Merrick Architecture and they're applying to rezone the site which is to my left to build 127 market condos um, and only 25 seniors housing units. The coalition of youth organizations that came together today oppose um, this rezoning application for 105 Kiefer and fi uh, 544 Columbia Street. Instead, we demand that the site be dedicated to 100% affordable seniors housing. And we demand that the site include public accessible community and cultural spaces. You might be wondering why hold an alternative open house instead of engaging with the one that is happening later on today. We've attended these open houses in the past and believe that there's no meaningful engagement or process about what the community truly needs. They host a space to put their ideas and proposal with business interests in mind. But our goal here today is to bring forth the community's vision of what that space should be. We want to bring the community together to oppose Chinatown's latest development and to hold a real conversation about this important site in the heart of Chinatown and what the impact will be in the community. We're holding this event to express not only our opposition to the proposed development at this site, we also want to discuss and build a common vision for this site that would best serve the needs of Chinatown. To be clear, we don't oppose all development in Chinatown, but we do believe that all development must address the needs of seniors and low-income housing in the community while preserving Chinatown's heritage. <laughs> coalition of Chinese youth organizations came together because we understand that this is a very important fight for our generation. We acknowledge that we come from a long history of activism within the Chinese Canadian community and we are coming together with a desire to see Chinatown thrive, not only socially, economically, politically, but also culturally. And just to acknowledge the organizations that have been a part of this group are Hua Foundation, Youth Collaborative for Chinatown, the Chinatown Action Group, and Youth for Chinese Seniors. So we're here today and we're asking people to do a couple of actions with us. The first is to fill out some feedback forms to the city. Although I said earlier that the process itself is not as engaging or meaningful. We do want to make it loud and clear that we don't support this development. We want you to reflect on your connection to Chinatown, your thoughts on 105 Kiefer's rezoning application, what is your vision for the site, and ultimately for Chinatown. And we've got some artists here today um, who can help you with that. You can also talk to us, or this mic is also available if you have a story or vision that you'd like to share with everyone. At around 5 p.m., 5 p.m., we will walk over in opposition to the open house just a couple of uh, blocks from here. <laughs> okay, that's good. Excellent. Yeah. Actually, I'm trying to the toss up between eating dinner. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, no, everybody's waiting. Oh, 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 o
Have you eaten yet? At one time, this was the most common form of greeting amongst Chinese in Canada. Hello, I'm Sid Tan, and welcome to A Common Bond, the Gold Mountain Edition. Have you eaten yet? We'll get back to that later, but right now, I'd just like to say that I'm as pleased as plum sauce on a barbecue duck to have with us three members of Army, Navy, Air Force Veterans Unit 280. We're going to shoot the breeze and chew the fat about little known incidences and well-known issues in the Chinese Canadian community. These will probably be of concern to most Canadians. Without further ado, I'd like to get this chop suey of the show going by introducing our three guests. To my far right is Harry Kahn, a member of the Order of Canada. He's the co-author of From China to Canada, the definitive book of Chinese communities in Canada. He's also been past president of the Chinese Freemasons in Canada and presently president of the Vancouver chapter of the Chinese Freemasons. He's the director of the Chinese Times and he served with Force 136 in the Burma India Theater of Operations with Lord Louis Mountbatten. Welcome to our show, Mr. Khan. Thanks, Sid. Just call me Harry. I'll call you Harry. Thank you, Harry. Okay. Next to Harry is Roy Ma. Roy Ma is the editor of the Chinatown News and a past president and secretary of the Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans Unit 280. He, along with Harry Khan, was one of a trio of non-commissioned officers which led the first contingent of Chinese Canadian servicemen overseas to the India Burma Theater of Operations under the command of Lord Louis Mountbatten. Welcome to our show, Mr. Mr. Ma. Thank you, Sid. Just call me Roy. I'll call you Roy. Thank you, Roy. And next to Roy, and to my immediate right, is Gim Wang. Jim Wong is presently Secretary of Unit 280, Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans. 
He was with the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force, from 1944 to 45. He's a trained air gunner, flight engineer, and had the rank of pilot officer. His father arrived in Canada in 1906 at the age of 15. Mr. Wang is currently 68, having been born in 1922. He's worked as an auto mechanic and a collision repairman for over 40 years. He still likes to customize cars and motorcycles and tootles around on his motorcycle at this time and at this day. Welcome to the show, Mr. Wang. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Yeah, you can call me Gim. Oh, I knew. Thank you, Gim. I guess, first of all, Army, Navy, Air Force Veterans Unit 280. This seems to be a very special unit, and it has its own interesting history. We were talking earlier, and uh, Mr. Ma was, was giving us some interesting reasons why it's the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans as opposed to the Royal Canadian Le Legion. I'm just wondering if you could tell our audience a little about that. Well, Sid, uh, let's just say that uh, the Canadian Legion was very happy to accept us as individual members into their uh, different uh, units, whereas the Army and Navy Air Force had no hesitation in issuing a charter to us as a group, all Chinese Canadian unit and uh, they welcomed such a unit with open arms so that was the reason why we uh, eventually end up uh, as an affiliate of the army navy air force veterans in canada so so i guess after the uh after the return of all the servicemen from overseas did a group of chinese canadian servicemen get together and say let's form a chapter approach the legion we're not able to get a charter and then decided to form their own group with the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans? Well, a group of us got together and then we explored the uh, various various uh, options. We uh, did uh, approach the uh, Canadian Legion, make, making soundings, uh, you know, to get their reaction, and uh, that was the reaction that we got from them. The, the Army, Navy, and Air Force veterans unit is a very well-known sort of organization within the Chinese community and you've done a lot of work. I know that you've been instrumental in putting up plaques at the Chinese Cultural Center and you've also been supportive of a lot of what we would call Lo Wa Kyo or Ch early Chinese Canadian history. Uh, Mr. Khan, I wonder if you might tell us how it is that that plaque came to being and when it came into being and why it took so long. Yes. Uh you know, uh, since the Second World War, uh, our member is about, uh, at the, uh, during the war, the uh, Chinese uh, Canadian that joined the service totally is about uh, 600 of us. Now, after 40 years, our members, uh, the members getting old and uh, they are passing on, so getting less and less. So uh, we feel now is the time to record all those uh, veterans that who served in the uh, Second World War, and we should put a plaque on to honor them, to uh, telling the people, the new immigrant and the new citizen that come into this country, that it is you know, this uh, this group of people, this group of young men who served in the Second World War in order to fight for our right of today. Now, the right we got today is not easy to come by. It is take a group of us people that during the time uh, before, third, before the Second World War, we don't have the right as, the one, uh, as we are having now, and we have to fight for it. That, that's the one of the reason we want to put the plaque up you know, to uh, honor this group of people who serve the uh, to, to serve the country that we call Canada, and also to serve with that we serve the Chinese people also in Canada, and also to benefit you know, the new immigrant that comes in to enjoy the privilege they got today. That's one of the reasons we set up the plan. Well, as I understand, the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans is considered one of the the major building 
organizations in terms of the Chinese in Canada. In other words, if it was not for returning war veterans, I think that some of the rights and privileges would have not been that easily attained. But before we get into that, I'd like to uh, understand that at that time, you were all very, very young men. And uh, I guess maybe I'll address Mr. Wong, that uh, how is it that at that time, you came to join the armed forces, especially when you had none of the rights and privileges. What made you decide to join the armed forces? Well, um, <clears throat> I was um, I was always interested in um, airplanes, and I used to read about um, the First World War flyers and all that sort of thing, and. Um, I built model planes as a, uh, when I was a kid, and um, when the war started uh, in 1939, I was uh, 17, and um, I, I, read, I read about uh, the Battle of Britain, and uh, I, uh, I just thought it'd be just great to uh, fly um, Spitfire. Why not? So um, I beat my head against a brick wall for. Um, three, four years, and uh, they accepted uh, an interview, and uh, I uh, finally talked my way into it. But uh, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Did, I, did you find any inconsistencies in terms of the fact that here you are fighting for a country which did not allow you rights and privileges of a citizen? Well, you got to remember, if we were born in China, uh, we would be uh, fighting with uh, the Chinese uh, forces there, because uh, you know we were we were uh, draft age, and um, we consider ourselves 100% uh, Canadian, although uh, we were um, Chinese descent. And uh, I didn't see that uh, we were fighting the Japanese, uh, the Germans, or the Italians as being any different. And uh, you know if we were fighting it from from China, uh, I thought it was just appropriate because I was born here. And uh, uh, many Chinese did try to get in, yes, but uh, I was one of the lucky ones who got accepted uh, as air crew. Yeah, I I'm a little lost well, on this. Just, oh, yes, uh, let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, uh, to go back uh, in history, uh, we have to understand the political and social climate of the time. At that time, uh, Chinese Canadians were second-class citizens. Politically, we were completely disenfranchised. We don't have the right to vote. We don't have the right to hold public office. We don't have a right to say in our national or provincial or civic affairs. That's politically. Economically, we were deprived of all kinds of job opportunities. We can't practice law, we can't practice pharmacy, we can't practice uh, accountancy. So in essence, we were nothing more than second-class citizen. When the war came along, we said how to rectify the situation. Now there were two groups with uh, opposing viewpoints. One group, uh, including myself, said, uh, Okay, now that the country is in need of manpower, let's rally to Canada's colors, and when we come back, we would have solid credentials to demand our rights as equal citizens along with the other uh, Canadians. The other group say, no, don't go, don't enlist now, Wait till they give us and franchise us first, recognize us as Canadians first before we will enlist. So there was a debate, and ultimately, our group went out, the group that favors enlisting now, and asked for uh, remedying of the situation later. That group went out. So that's how we uh, went into the uh, our forces. Yeah. An interesting thing is that, as I understand, all three of you were born in Canada. 
And one of the things that we really, I find myself hard to understand is that how you could be living in a country, and I don't understand this, not having the franchise and not having the rights and privileges. And I, I'd, I'd just like to ask Mr. Khan if, yeah. if you thought that at that time that particularly going out, joining the armed forces, would lead to more rights and privileges? Or yes, I, I agree with Roy because uh, we were there at the same time. I, I remember during that time uh, we have two choices, as Roy said. One is to go, one is not to go. Uh, the other choice, uh, you could stay behind and join the zombie. You know, you don't have to go overseas. But uh, my own feeling, my, my own p opinion at that time, you know, as, well, as, you, as Roy said, we are young men, we can, you know, a lot of heroism, and try to do something for the country, yeah? and also try to do something for the future, you know, future generation of our people. And at that time, uh, my my way of thinking, uh, you know, we if we join the service, not only help Canada, indirectly also help our you know, uh, help the help our mother country in you know, China where we come from. So uh, because uh, the war in Japan and. Uh, and the and Kennedy government need us to serve. That's the reason why we we feel if we serve Canada now, then we will have a better future when we come back. You know? Fortunately, we all come back, and we demand our rights. That's why today, you know, all our young people, people like you, you know, could enjoy as a Can full Canadian citizenship. Yeah. You could you could be a sit here, be a producer, a director, or a TV movie star. <laughs> no, the thing we uh, we could enjoy, and we have to. No, we, we actually, uh, uh, at that time, most most of uh, our people who serve uh, have the same feeling that we are fighting for the future, the betterment for our people, and also for Canada.
I'm here with uh, with my colleagues from the House of Commons, Libby Davies and Don Black, and also representing our entire caucus in the House of Commons. The first time I saw one of these certificates, it was shown to me by a dear friend of mine in 1975. He took it out of his pocket. Where it was folded up and it had been with him all of these years. His name was Deep Kwan. And Deep had come and he had worked on the railroad. He had worked uh, in a restaurant in Saskatchewan. He had worked in a mine in northern Ontario. He had worked in a dry cleaning shop in Toronto. In his senior years, he volunteered at the university settlement house. Where he met a young girl who was playing ping pong table tennis. Her name was Olivia Chow. A few years later, I met Olivia Chow. And her mother. <laughs> and 
Deep Kwan came to our wedding when we got married. Um, Deep Kwan, this this old couple, came to our wedding when we got married. Um, Deep Kwan, this this old couple, came to our wedding when we got married. Um, Deep Kwan, On the project of redress for the head tax. Um, ah, Deep Kwan, then, and ah, Zhou Ziwei, then, they together did this to make the tax pay less. Ah, they did a lot of work for the head tax. And Olivia and Deep and many others made Xerox copies of the head tax certificates from people in our community in Toronto. Thousands of them. Ah, Deep, then, then, ah, for the tax collector, then, they made copies. 啊，千幾幾千張嘅啊，影印嗰啲啊，人頭碎紙嘅。She was working for Member of Parliament Dan Heath, who was working with Margaret Mitchell on her proposal in the House of Commons for redress. 嗰陣時咧，阿周志偉咧就係幫啊一個國會議員咧叫做 Dan Heath 嘅，咁啊幫佢做事嘅，咁啊亦都係咧就嗰陣時開始咧，咁啊 Dan Heath 啊就。國會議員啦，就同 Margaret Mitchell 啦，就一齊工作嘅為呢件事。Deep Kwan died before he was able to hear the apology in the House of Commons 22 years later. Deep Kwan 咧就已經過咗世啦，咁啊喺人啊啊道道歉之前咧就已經過咗世嘅。啊！咁呢個人落税嘅啊申請咧，已經係經經歷咗二十二年嘅，佢已經過咗世嘅，就佢冇聽過。Too many, too many thousands of head taxpayers died before they could hear that apology or receive the redress. 上千上萬嘅人頭税負主咧，已經係過咗世嘅，就從來冇機會聽到咧道歉，同埋咧得到賠償嘅。But their families are carrying the pain of that memory. But their families are carrying the pain of that memory. Of that discrimination. The family separation. And that's why this campaign is so important. So why this. 要求係咁重要嘅。My colleagues and I are very honoured to have received the honorary membership card. 我同埋我啲朋友咧，覺得係好光榮嘅，可以收到咧呢個會嘅榮譽會員。And we very strongly support the three demands that have been set forward today. 我哋好強烈嘅支持啊呢個三個要求。We look forward to joining with you in signing the petition and in presenting the petition in the House of Commons of Canada. We are very happy to be able to sign the petition in the House of Commons of Canada and to sign the petition to the government. So, friends, it's a it's a battle for justice. We have taken an important first step in Canada. But we don't stop until we reach the end of that path. 朋友們，我哋要為正義、公義嚟繼續奮鬥。Now, uh, Sid was uh, kind enough to, uh, and your organization, to give me this honorary membership. But I feel uh, that for Olivia and I, we'd like to still pay our ten dollars uh, each. So I want to... July the 1st, there is an event that you coordinate around town, and uh, it's July 1st coming up, so can you tell us a little bit about the event, why you coordinate it, and uh, why people should come down? We, we call it our Canada Day Redress Rally, and what it is is a celebration of the fact that head tax families, it's put on by Head Tax Families Society of Canada, are proud to be Canadians participating in the political process and to show people that the issue of Chinese head tax and exclusion is not done. The Harper government did a unilaterally imposed settlement and it's incomplete and we believe it's incomplete because not all head tax 
tax families and exclusion families have been addressed. So the redress is incomplete. We believe that the redress should be inclusive and include still the surviving affected seniors. And also that we believe that uh, the redress should be done in the spirit of one certificate, one claim. So that's why we're having the rally because we're still pursuing this and it's for us, it's celebratory. We come together, we do a photo op, and we go eat. Well, I know that uh, that you've been at this a long time. Now, when you say that the redress is not complete, can you just take us back? Because I remember Harper did do some kind of, uh, what, he did some kind of apology. There was some monies, I think, given back. But but, but what, what, what are you saying? That's... Uh that's not, not adequate or or that um, they, they weren't able to continue on with the mandate? What What is the stuff? Well, the Harper government just basically took an issue of justice and honor for our community. That is the low Teal community, the pioneer Chinese families community, which were affected by head tax and exclusion. There were 80, uh, 80 some odd thousand families. The redress was received the ex gratio payment was received by less than 800 families. That represents less than 1% of all the families affected. So it's incomplete in that matter. Moreover, it's incomplete in the fact that the Harper government did not take into account the exclusion families, which was more insidious than the head tax. The head tax was a tax grab. Governments continue to do tax grabs. The exclusion acts were actually family separation. They were to destroy or to not let the Chinese community grow in Canada. And when you think of laws that separate families, I mean, our, 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 our life, our, our values are about family togetherness. And here we have legislation specifically put in place, racist legislation that separated Chinese families. So that part has not been addressed either. And for Harper to apologize for that, our family rejected it because our family was not included in the redress. Neither my grandmother or grandfather, who were directly affected by these things, and my father are still alive. <laughs> and so we did not qualify for any of this redress and the issue is not that the Harper government should apologize. Apologize is, is very simple. What is an apology? I believe that an apology is a admission of wrongdoing. It's an admission of wrongdoing and it should be healing for the person giving the apology. It should be redemptive also for the person that's giving the apology and for the people receiving it there should be an element of restorative justice and healing involved and there was none of this except for the less than 800 families right so uh, on July 1st what, what happens what time and what location we will be there I will be there at 10 30 we are gathering at 11 11 is the call time and we'll all be there is at the uh, memorial to Chinese railway workers and war veterans at the corner of Kiefer and Columbia, 11 o'clock. Be there. And I would just like to mention that this is the 90th anniversary of the Exclusion Act, the enact when it was excluded, when it was brought into place, July 1st, 1923, Canada Day, which for years and years was known as Humiliation Day amongst the Chinese in Canada. It's the 90th and it's the 8th. Now, Eight is a lucky number. It's the eighth anniversary of the redress rally.
presidents to represent me. I'm out for dead for all presidents to represent me. I was illegal in this country. When I arrived in this country, I arrived as an illegal immigrant. Mm. But as I got older, uh, I recognized that uh, my brother, my adopted brother and I could be deported at any time. Mm. Uh, this after our family had been in North America since the advent of the California Gold Rush in 1849. And yet it is only my children who were born in 73 and 75, are the first in our family to be born in North America. That's after a hundred years, a hundred and some odd years. That tells you what exclusion and head tax and racist immigrant policies can do. Mm. And my grandparents suffered that. My grandmother and grandfather were separated for 25 years by a racist law. My grandfather paid a head tax uh, which was the equivalent of two houses when he came here. You could buy two houses for $500. As I got involved in these issues, these issues changed my life. I rearranged my life so I could, so I could continue to participate and, and, and uh, if you want to call, sort of be one of the leaders in the movement. Uh, I became self-employed. I uh, learned skills to be a media producer. I learned skills to be a community organizer. All these things I had to do when I got involved. So, you know, for young people, I would say that, you know, this is your world. You know, you're the future. Get involved, but get involved with the idea of contributing and get involved when you have your bases covered. And when I say that, don't count on the movement or what you're getting into to provide your basics. Uh, the two campaigns that, that I, I, I have put about 25, 30 years into is uh, the Chinese Head Tax and Exclusion Redress Campaign and also Community Television. I joined the Redress Campaign in 83 and uh, Community Television in 86. However, this one poem um, made me the most money. Uh, it was used by a lot of uh, educational books throughout uh, the world. They uh, decided this was a poem they wanted to use for teaching. And the poem came out of something that was quite interesting for me because I was sitting in Chinatown just back in the 70s, and I, I was hearing, overhearing these three Chinese elders um, um, having a competition. And the competition was who suffered the most. And so, you know, it was going in that kind of direction. So you think that was bad, I'll tell you how this was and so on. And out of there came this one piece, and I think I should write more about it later on, but uh, it came out with one piece, and it's called Equal Opportunity. In early Canada, when railways were highways, each stop brought new opportunities. There was a rule. The Chinese could only ride the last two cars of the train. That is, until a train derailed, killing all those in front. 
The Chinese erected an altar and thanked Buddha. A new rule was made. The Chinese must now ride the front two cars of the train. <laughs> that is, until another accident claimed everybody in the back. <laughs> the Chinese erected an altar and thanked Buddha. After much debate, common sense prevailed. The Chinese are now allowed to sit anywhere on any train. <laughs> and welcome back to this portion of the program. Let me turn my, my thing off here. So I'm gonna loop. There we go, sorry about that. Um, let's put Sid on the air too. So the two of us are up on the screen at the same time. Wow, Sid. Um, I've known you for a long time, um, but I think this is the first time I'd really had an opportunity to sit down and get a sense of the breadth of the, the work that you've done over the last number of decades. I really had no idea. Um, what an impressive body of work. Um, and I think of all those videos that you put in a box or a couple of suitcases and you left at my, my office and said, can you keep these in storage for me? Um, I'm going to come back to that um, in a minute, but um, what a time journey. So I'm seeing, you know, Harry Kahn, who I knew in the 1980s, um, 1970s, when he ran the post office in Chinatown and seen all these Jim Wong Chu, Chu and, you know, who's passed away. Um, a lot of people have passed away. Um, What's it like for you looking back on all these videos and what do you what do you think about what you know what are the feelings that you get when you look back on this incredible body of work that you've done over over the last four five decades I just think about how much more there is to be done to really tell the history of the Chinese in Canada uh, we have not gotten a fair telling and until we tell our own stories, uh, it'll never be told properly, I think. And that's what I've tried to do is, is try and tell the story of head tax and try and tell the story of community media. Mm. Mm -hmm. And did you come to broadcasting through social justice or were you already in broadcasting and used social and then just brought social justice into that or what what was driving you in in this melding of the social justice and the and the um the broadcasting which came first or were they both at the same time um i i think i just came to it quite by accident i was doing a bit of advertising sales and journalism uh, for Mo Cho Lin, who uh, published the Chinese Canadian Press. And then I, I got uh, uh, an opportunity to sell advertising for the Chinatown News. And uh, my feeling is that uh, if you can sell Chinese advertising <laughs> where you don't know the language that well and uh, don't speak it that well, then you can pretty near do anything. So I, I just kept doing it. And then after a few years, uh, we did a couple of projects uh, for the money. And, uh, and then we, uh, I got an invite to uh, host a community television show. And when I started doing that, then I started learning how to edit and uh, 
shoot and do all these things. And uh, I, I, for the record, I must correct myself in that I did take a night class at BCIT in video production. But the reality is it wasn't really that much help to me because it was too advanced and I was kind of a hands-on guy. And how old were you, Sid, when you did this and, and place us in time here? Is this 1970s or the 1980s or? Um, I, I did my first show in 1986, just after Expo. Mm. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the portion with Jim Wong Chu. I think that was Hopman Cito. Uh, on camera with Ed Kwan and Dennis Lum helping. And then the Asia Pacific Festival came in in 87, and that's when I started, uh, as it were, producing mm. uh, field pieces. And it just took off from there. And then uh, I realized, wow, uh, a guy can make a living at this. Because you have to remember, this was all community television equipment. Uh, back then when I started, it was three-quarter inch tape, three-quarter mm. inch pneumatic linear editing. I remember those big things. <laughs> I have a bunch of them in the archives myself at my yeah. storage, um, sitting there needing to be transferred over into digital format. Um, so was that work that the that, that, that community television, that you said that you were invited to host a show, was that through uh, Shaw Community Television? Uh, back then, it was Rogers. Uh -huh. Shaw bought Rogers. We didn't become Shaw until 97, 98 or something like that. Okay. Okay. And and was that the... I, I know I know you through that time since I met you when you started first interviewing me. The first time you interviewed me was in 2003 when they did the Downtown Eastside Community Play. I remember that. that. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. very clearly too. I think that was the first time I met you, and um, that was through Shaw. So Shaw was, my sense is that Shaw was very instrumental as a platform for you to bring these voices of the community and so that you were very much using um, community television as a platform. Is that is that an accurate description or were you using other platforms too? Uh, I was on I was on YouTube by then, uh, 2003, and okay. uh, I was using that as a platform and that's why uh, uh, some of the archive things from 87 still exist. Hmm. Hmm. And you mentioned all the teamwork that at the top when you were acknowledging people. Um, tell us about that. You know, um, I'm learning that broadcasting, which is we're doing now for the first time for the Heart of the City Festival, ourself and putting up stuff on the website and having camera crews and streaming engineers and videographers and crediting. Oh, my gosh, what a world. It's quite a shift for me. Um, very high demand in terms of the number of people that you're using and you were acknowledging all the the people at the top it's a it's a really heavy teamwork kind of a project so you really had to bring in a lot of people in the community to engage in this process and um talk about that and 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 how you did that and did just people come to it because they were interested in broadcasting or because they also wanted to fight for social justice or a combination of both. Yeah, give us some give us some insight into that whole team that you had to pull together and work with. When I started at community television in 1986, there were literally, I would say, 10,000 community television volunteers working out of four neighborhood offices in Vancouver. Wow. The neighborhood offices were uh, uh, at Burrard. There were two neighborhood offices there, Central and Kitsilano. There was Van East and there was the West End. They were neighborhood offices. Uh, most people in East Van probably remember the Van East office uh, at 1010 Commercial. Uh, 
the there were a lot of people willing to lend a hand and there were a lot of people willing to spend time just to get involved either as uh you know on camera off camera and all this and it was a fertile training ground for anybody that wanted to get into bcit take broadcast journalism mm -hmm. do filmmaking that was the training ground and it's all gone now it's all yeah. gone now now that's that's what happens when you put uh, corporations in charge of community television. They mm -hmm. eliminate it because they don't see it as a profit center, where they should see it as community building. And neither Shaw or Rogers ever saw it that way. Corporations don't see it that way. If they can't make a buck at it, they're not going to do it. And and they got millions millions of dollars to support community television across the country when there was a 5% levy on basic cable. And that's all gone now, too. And they lobbied for that, I understand, right? They wanted to get rid of that. I remember you talking about this a number of years ago and trying to fight against this change that was taking place. Yeah, well, we stuck it out. I mean, the what came after this when we were having trouble with corporate cable, so to speak, was uh, ICTV, Independent Community Television, and uh, worked on that for a while. Uh, uh, we got the Vanny's office for a year, and then we rented an office, and uh, uh, then had to move out and went to Pandora Street, and... Uh, ICTV still exists. In fact, they're having their AGM December 8th at 8 o'clock, uh, virtual. Mm. And we're going to discuss trying to bring back some kind of ICTV. Or uh, now, uh, I, along with a number of other people, have formed Full Figure Media, which uh, is going to use the Internet as a platform. Yeah, I was. In, I wanted to ask you. One of my questions was, how has broadcasting changed since when you first started working till now? And you, you're kind of touching upon that. Um, you know what I see in my own layman's way with my limited knowledge is that it was primarily taking through place through the community televisions in the in the 80s, and then for a number of decades. And now that that's being demolished, that these other multiple platforms are. Are there and perhaps you don't have as wide of a reach or wide as an audience obviously with with something well i shouldn't say obviously but i would think um because you don't have access to the cable so talk about that change and 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 that adjustment that you guys who are interested in in broadcasting and reaching the public what what how you're having to adapt well the adaptation the very simple thing about uh community television was working as a team. And it was a team and it was getting a crew together and it was getting together, you know, like one or two Sundays a month, a team and everybody knew what they needed to do. And we continued this up until I don't know, about 213, 214 uh, with uh, you know, uh, constant lobbying cable companies and all that. And uh, finally, uh, they decided to ship their money to what they call regional programming and not community programming. Mm. And regional programming is, is just another word for stealing money from the community to sell their advertising, in my opinion. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I would like to make a case for that someday, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> We're getting some great questions coming in from the audience uh, and some very nice uh, compliments. And I should mention, Sid, that you've got some family mem members uh, from Edmonton watching, uh, listening in and, and sending, you, sending them their greetings and love. And so here's the first question. Sid. You've had a long history of activism, the redress of Chinese Canadian to uh, pardon me, my, my pronunciation, walk you, decriminalization of marijuana, the environment, the gentrification, and the demise of China, Chinatown. What have you found the most challenging and 
the most satisfying? Uh, trying to lose weight. <laughs> And get have, you some you that with, have you documented that film, that sin with a video? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, you know, I spend a lot of money to look the way I do. <laughs> yes, us, us prairie boys, we spend a lot of money in our clothing and our appearance. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Sid and I share family roots back to Saskatchewan and Battleford and my mom grew up in the same area and my family ate his, at his parents restaurant in in the Battleford area. Just on another note and a rift on that, I, uh, I co-admin the you know you grew up in Battleford if you remember. <laughs> no, it's a Facebook group. And, okay. And we have about 600 members. Okay. Well, and, I, it, and it's unique to Battleford as opposed to North Battleford. Yes, which absolutely. is uh, Newtown. Yeah. And of course, Battleford is Old Town. That's right. And uh, that's sort of a, been a bit, Facebook has been a bit of a platform for me to get stuff out. And, and it, it's, uh, it's building community. We, we have counselors and uh, former mayors and all that on, 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 on this Facebook page. Oh. And, and that's communication and that's community building. And, and my plan is uh, my grandfather and grandmother are buried in North Battleford. Mm. And uh, when the time comes, uh, I'll, I'll probably go back there too. Mm. But I, I, wanna, I wanna make it back there on this side of the grass, uh, <laughs> you know, to visit because a lot of people, I, I still know a lot of people back there. Yeah. A couple of my best childhood friends still live there. And uh, I just think about how different life would have been if I would have uh, just settled in Battleford and forgot university and uh, ran my grandfather's store. Mm. I'd probably be a lot wealthier, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've got behind me my, my uh, ancestors there, my grandfather and Grandmother, they're all from the Battleford area there. Eagle Hills. Um, I know where that is. Prongy. <laughs> yeah, I know where that is. <laughs> my, I asked my mom, my grandmother, where is Prongy? And she said, oh, it's just two roads crossing in the middle of nowhere, was her description of Prongy. <laughs> yeah, I put a, uh, a little uh, thing about the history of Prongy up on the, you grew up in Battleford. Okay, well, I have, to get my, I have to get my mom tapped into that. But, um, but so we're getting on a little side trail here, Sid. So, but in all seriousness, this is a really good question from, from, um, from, uh, from someone. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know who posted it. You know, what did you find the most challenging part of the work that you did over all these decades? The challenging part of doing it as a volunteer is you don't really have any control. Uh, that is, you can't really fire anybody. You can't say, where well, you're not going to get paid. You're not getting paid anyhow. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, and control may be the wrong word. So you have to have people skills. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's one thing I realized a long time ago when uh, I was a graduate student and, and took something called Bale's Interaction Analysis and uh, all these things that you learn in an academic way and, and try and put them into use in the real world. And, and so uh, you have to be kind of kinder and gentler mm. than in the real world when you work with people that are there because they want to be and they want to learn and and you have to understand how much fr frustration or even anger people can can muster up when they think you're doing something wrong mm. then on the other hand um 
live television production is basically hierarchical. Mm. In other words, there's a director who calls the shot. There's a producer who gets you the resources uh, for the director. And then there's the executive, executive producer who basically says, we don't have the budget. <laughs> we can't do that. And, and these are things that you have to do. So even while I was doing this as a volunteer, I, I, I was contributing time and often money, you know, for lunches and uh, things like that to keep the volunteers happy. Mm. And that's been the greatest challenge is, is keeping people happy while they're doing what they like without hating you <laughs> mm -hmm. or disliking you. And I'm going to move on. We've only got about another five or 10 minutes. I think we can go over by a few minutes, but um, there's some more great questions. Sh uh, Sean Gunn is often a partner in your art and activism. Can you explain how the two of you originally met? And some have suggested that Sean is better looking one. Can you confirm if this is true either way? Uh, I'm not going to touch that question because it'll only <laughs> get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I run for politics. I you know how to answer questions sometimes. <laughs> and I, I met, I, I know exactly when I met Sean, actually. I met him for the first time, I believe, in 1982 when there was a theater company called Crossroads that did a version of David Henry Wang's uh, Fresh Off the Boat. This is before the TV series Fresh Off the Boat, of course. This was 1982. And Sean was playing Chapman Stick on stage. And I'd never seen a Chapman Stick before. I never knew what it was. And uh, I took the opportunity to ask him what that instrument was. He told me. We struck up a conversation. And uh, we've been friends since 82. Mm. And then we have another one, question three. Sid, you mentioned you gave up a lot as other activists to pursue your activism. And can you speak to what the experience is like to be, for example, transacting in an industry with multinationals and then to be fighting against big oil companies later on? Uh, the struggle often is sometimes satisfying. That's, that's what I gave up. Uh, I, I gave up a lot of self-satisfaction to get involved, but then I didn't know really any other way to live. If something's happening and something's wrong, of course, I'm going to try and do whatever I can to to fix it or, or to help people that are, are being oppressed. And I, I, I just took the example of my grandmother and grandfather uh, who, you know, uh, suffered far more than I uh, in order to live and come to Canada. Uh, they were separated for 20 some odd years when they first got married. Um, mm. And so I've always found sacrifice rather easy because uh, I don't see myself as, as the center of the universe. Mm. Mm. So you just try and, and lend a hand where you can. You try and uplift people. You try and inspire people. And sometimes you do it, and sometimes you don't. And you certainly did that over decades and decades. That's certainly what came across to me is watching this extraordinary breadth of, of commitment that you personally made over decades and the fight for the head tax just being won. And then you've talked about the disappointment about how limited that the results of that fight has been. And, you know, we could talk about that um, you know, in quite a bit more depth, but I wanted to ask you um, it, to explore this idea um, that you're kind of just alluding to a little bit around the people. 
after you've been now doing this work for so long and you've gained a lot of wisdom and experience, you've been around the block many a time, um, what are the key thoughts or things that you would share with young activists um, and especially people who want to get involved in broadcasting um, that you would uh, say to them? Oh, my goodness. Uh, actually, my first piece of advice would be uh, if, if you're interested, it uh, doesn't matter when you start, uh, make sure that you build relationships. Mm. Building relationships has been the key to the way I've been able to work. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the long-term relationships. I, 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 you know, you brought up the example of Sean. I met him in 82. Um, he was playing Chapman stick. And then we've done a lot of collaborations and music and all kinds of things. I'm not a musician. Uh, and so it was helpful to have somebody like that who was good, could turn a phrase. Uh, you know, Sean is basically a poet at heart. Mm. Uh, he's written a lot of good poetry. Uh, and uh, it's Jim Wong Chu, build relationships. Long relationships, long good relationships. It, it's all about relationships. If uh, it, it, I would find it difficult to 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 work with people uh, where number one it's hard. I, I have this old saying, and in, in, in when you work with me, I always used to say, "It'll be on time, it'll be on budget, uh, and uh, I'm easy to work with," and you know, our goal is to get it done. Mm. Mm. And, and that's, uh, that's the way I work. I, sometimes when you're in it, you don't think about it. Like I've been relishing the fact that uh, I, I've been self-isolating since the COVID in, at the end of December, I was or at the end of February, and uh, I've been out like eight or 10 times. Out, out of my apartment eight or ten times since it started. And I'm lucky to have people that have given me a hand with shopping and and getting combustibles <laughs> and things like that. And, uh, and I, I've been really enjoying it because I have never had a stretch of, of this time mm. Uh, uh, to really think, and I and and when I say think, I, I, I'm talking about critical thinking of what I should do in the next ten years, in the next five years, next year for that matter, and and I'm just trying to move forward uh, the struggle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we have a question from um, I think it's from Mike Ma. Um, I'm not quite sure how the chat works here. I think the name at the top is the name that asked the question. What are your thoughts on the incomplete redress for head taxpayers? It seems the activism of years past is greatly diminished, but the historical injustice has yet to be fully acknowledged or redressed. Thoughts on whether head tax will be lost to history or whether it returns? And yes, it is from Mike Ma. Well, Mike, uh, I feel that uh, we may have to write our own stories and tell our own stories, and they may not be realized until 100 years from now. It's, it's, it's going to be a long struggle because from what I can tell, uh, the federal government, provincial government, and the civic governments have more or less put the issue to rest. I think people should know that less than 800 head taxpayers or spouses 
of deceased head taxpayers actually got the $20,000 ex gratia, that is no legal obligation payment. That is less than one half of 1% of all head tax families that were individually acknowledged. I think it would be fair of the government to actually get a list of all the head tax families and find if they have uh, progeny or descendants and do something for them because a lot of the excluded wives, like my grandmother, who got married in 1926 and was not able to live with her husband until 1950, and and uh, there I've been reading a book about excluded wives and children, and uh, something needs to be done for them while they're still alive. And that, this is not in ancient history. Uh, you know, John Quechen was in high school when when the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed. So there's still a lot more to be done, and it will be done in the future, I hope. And uh, I, I believe that the Lo Wa Kyo, the old overseas Chinese, will become a very distinguished thread in the mm. history of Canada. Because we not only, when I say we, I'm the spawn of Lo Wa Kyo. And they not only had to deal with the climate and the geography of Canada, they had to deal with the people of Canada. And it's clear in my mind, although there's still the remnants of racist colonialism, that we're going to win this. A mm. hundred years from now, our, our descendants, our spawn will be saying, hey, I'm descended from a low Wakil family. You know, we're number one. We're the greatest. We're the best. <laughs> and take pride in the fact that they're Chinese Canadians. Hmm. Thank you, Sid. And we have a question from Nat L L L Lau. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce your name. Uh, Nat, L-O-W-E, low. He says, hi, Sid. I'm curious about what are your reflections from your years of activism and coalition building within the Chinese community around working together pro productively and overcoming conflict? Well, conflict seems to be a pretty natural part of the social intercourse. Um, I, uh, hi, Nat. I don't really have a good answer for you because uh, I have always been in conflict with the so-called Chinatown establishment. You know, the, uh, the Uncle Tongs and Auntie uh, Egg Rolls and Wontons. Uh, they have never really liked what I've done uh, to a great extent. I remember when I came out against uh, uh, their uh, demonstrations against safe injection sites in, in the early 2000s. Uh, their, 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 there is a Chinatown establishment uh, which has grown from the new immigration and they don't know their history. They don't know Chinatown's history, which is Chinatown was always a place where poor people could find a place to live. That's the downtown east side. It used to be called Skid Row. People like Gene Swanson and Libby Davies and and Jim Green and others turned it into the Downtown East Side Residents Association. And that's, that's the kind of history. And if you look at Chinatown, it's, it's right there. It's, it's 
a block from Pender in the heart of Chinatown. And uh, uh, the only thing that I could do that I thought would be helpful uh, is, is try and not become part of today's Chinatown establishment, but to, uh, to rouse the young people because it's going to be the young people that are going to see it to the future because I'm not going to. Hmm. Um, thank you everyone for those wonderful questions. Um, now Sid, I wanted to ask you about all these incredible videos, this massive archive that you have boxes and boxes of videos of this and that and everything. And really, I mean, the, the quality of what I saw in what you guys worked with Alan. Thank you, Alan, for putting this together. I know he's in the room there with you hiding. There he is. Um, so these archives, they're a treasure trove. So what are your plans? They're going to end up at the city of Vancouver archives, Simon Fraser University archives. You got to save these things, man, and they need to be cataloged and 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 put in a place where the public can access them. It's an incredible documentation of decades of activism in the in the community. So tell me about that and tell me that you're working on archiving all this stuff that it'll be made into uh, a way that's going to be saved and made to the public. Well, I think one of the first things that I want to do is uh, get to the heart of the city archives, which I, I think I delivered eight boxes of tapes to. Is that what it was that you gave me? Those to city. No, they're, they're the heart of the city eight archives. Boxes. You know, the stuff that I've been doing for heart of the city for a number of years. I, I, I'm sorry, Sid. I didn't know that that was exclusively part of the city festival. Well, stuff. it's not exclusively, but uh, I would say the majority are. So what is the quantity of the your vast collection you left me eight boxes that must be what one two three percent of this massive collection what is the scale of what you have you know the storage locker that uh, heart of the city has which yes. is probably a large one it's about the size of a one ton truck or two ton mm -hmm. truck or more yeah um i have a locker like that and all my tapes are there. Plus, uh, I'm a bit of a pack rat. Uh, I have posters from Go For Broke, which uh, oh. Jim Wong Chu and I uh, tried to put together and uh, uh, had a loss. <laughs> we lost a bit of money on that one at the fire hall, uh, the Go For Broke, uh, two years of the festival. Uh, it, it's all there, but the problem with tape is that it demagnetizes. And I don't know what shape those tapes are in, but the ones I was able to dig out the last, since I started digging a few out, the last 20 years have survived remarkably well, which, uh, you know, you, you think about it, uh, three quarter inch tapes are gonna demagnetize slower unless they put something in them to make the tape better. Uh, than a uh, a mini DV tape, mm. you know. Mm. There's more surface to demagnetize. <laughs> I, I'm guessing. I I don't know, but uh, I I mean to find this out because uh, after the Heart of the City Festival, and uh, this is the only event that I've done for Heart of the City Festival. I I think I'm going to be asked into some kind of advisory group uh, regarding the Grunt Gallery. On, on actually preserving tape and, and, and doing archives and all that. Mm. So we'll see, it, it, it's a work in progress. And in fact, all the tapes I have now may be demagnetized already. The tapes that you have, they're gonna last a while. Okay. So this is, that's a massive project, isn't it, Sid? I mean, somebody could spend years digitizing all that content and cataloging it and... You could spend a lifetime doing it. I've kind of done it <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, sure first you got to get them. First you got to get them, and we got them. Yeah. We got the tapes. So that's that's the whole story, really. 
We yeah. have them. You have them, but somebody needs to now take them and do something that protects them and catalogs them in a way that can be preserved. And I know like Karen Jamieson Dance Company, for example, she has a lot of footage. She's, she's spending three or four years in archiving all her content. Um, and she's working, I think, with Simon Fraser University, I think, is cataloging all her stuff. Um, and it's going to be kept there in, in their archives. And it, it seems to me that you need to have an archival organization like the city of Vancouver or UBC or BCIT. I don't know if they have archives or Simon Fraser that some institution that will get behind this and, and help preserve all this content. Well, I'm looking for a independently wealthy sugar mama or sugar daddy. If anyone's out there, you just heard the call. <laughs> so, um, on that note, uh, we're looking for a sugar mama or sugar daddy to help archive Sid's incredible um, a library of, uh, of incredible footage that he's gathered over the years. What a treasure trove. We don't know yet. We don't know the shape of them. Uh, I haven't looked at them in about four or five years. Right. But that's part of the process is to go through them and, and see what is no longer good and what can be saved and then also cataloged. Exactly. Um, there's a lot of paper too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I collected uh, in that locker as well. And I, I think they would be of interest. Uh, I'm particularly interested in finding the the first interview I did with you during the uh, the community play. I think it was 203, 204. Yeah. 203. And, yeah, and I interviewed you at the Japanese Language Hall. That's I don't right. know if you recall that. Well, I do, very clearly. We were in the back storage room where all the chairs are. Exa yeah, and uh, we got we to gotta find that tape. Do you have it? I don't, I probably, somewhere in my archives. Here I'm encouraging you to, to preserve your archives, sir. And um, I've got the same situation. Uh, we've got three quarter inch tapes going back to the 1970s that are sitting in my, our storage locker that are sitting in boxes and need to be put through a digital machine, yeah. projected and cataloged. I'm thinking this may be on DVD, but I, I could be wrong. But uh, I, I'd love to get a copy of that. Uh, okay, let's do that together. After the festival, the new year. We after the festival. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Thank you for your amazing contribution over all the years. Um, thank you, Alwyn, who's sitting there in the background, who is crucial in gathering up. There you are. Thanks, Alwyn. Yeah. Gathering up all these um, videos and taping it all together. And um, thank you, audience, for all those great questions. Um, that's it from uh, Pender Guy at 470 East Pender Street. Jai Jian. And uh, we'll see you around the corner and, and down the river. Um, stay um, healthy, be kind to each other, everyone, and stay connected. And um, we'll see you around the corner. Thank you, Sid. Goodbye. Thank you. Friend.